All right, folks, my friends, good morning to all of you. And my watch is still 1029. That one is already 1031. So 1030. Okay, so let's, it's time to start so we can have uh, more time for discussion if we need. Glad to be here to see all of you here. Hope you had a great week. Uh, having a blessed Sabbath. We're going to start with a word of prayer. And Myron is going to pray for us. Sorry, Ed. Thank you, Heavenly Father, again, for the privilege of being able to meet together here in this place. And we're especially privileged that when we meet together, your spirit will join us. So we ask, ask for a special measure of your spirit while we study, while we discuss, while we learn more about you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Myron. If you were to, if you were given the chance to start your life over again, what would you do differently? When I lived in Germany several years ago, I read in a newspaper, uh, actually in a magazine, the story of these two gentlemen. And it was a kind of interview. Well, they were interviewed and then uh, the, they wrote that essay on the, on the magazine. Two gentlemen who had recently had a heart transplant. And they were asked the same question by the reporter or researcher, I don't remember exactly what he was, but they were asked the same question. What does it mean to you now that you have a new heart? What does it mean to you? And the first gentleman said, it means that I have my life back. I'm so glad I can still do the things that I always enjoy. I can do the things that pleases me and I, the things that please me and I'm so happy, so thrilled that I have my life back. And then the same question was asked to the second gentleman. What does it mean to you that you have a new heart? He said, well, I consider to me myself to be a lucky person. I have the chance to start over. And from now on, I will try to be a better person, to have a better life, to avoid the things that hurt me, that cause damage to my body. And I know those things very well. I'm having this chance of almost uh, being born again. And I will do my best to value this opportunity to extend my life, to live better life, to be a better person. If you are given the chance to start your life over again, what would you do differently? This week, we have studied the story. We are going to focus on the story of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is an interesting biblical character. And it is in the story of Nicodemus that we find this idea of a new birth more clearly than in any other passage in the New Testament. I decided to divide the story of Nicodemus. I was assigned the passage, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. So I decided to subdivide that passage in three parts, in four parts. Verses 1 to 8 which we will talk about the new birth, 9 to 13, heavenly things, and then 14 and 15, eternal life, and that interesting passage, verses 16 to 21, uh, about 
judgment. So, if we read the Gospels, we will find 46 people who met Jesus. 46 individuals who met Jesus. Perhaps the largest list, or one of the largest list, is found in John's Gospel. We have John the Baptist, and then we have Nicodemus, we have the Samaritan woman, the Galilean noble man, and the man at Bethesda, and several others. Several others. In some of those cases, we have examples of healings uh, with a following up story. In some of those cases, we have an interesting conversation that are related to, that is related to uh, salvation. And that is the case of Nicodemus, for example. That is the case of the Samaritan woman. So here we have the story. And let's start reading. Uh, who has verses 1 to 8? John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Before I read, I just found it so fascinating in Desire of Ages where she says that, I know you'll end on this, how Nicodemus supported the gospel, but Nicodemus told John about this dialogue. So this is, I thought that was so personal. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So it is, sorry, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Thank you very much. That is the first part of the story, first eight verses. And here Nicodemus is introduced, and he is introduced as a Pharisee. As a Pharisee. We know that there were several religious denominations in Judaism. Judaism was a divided religion, like Christianity today is a divided religion. We have Adventists, we have Methodists, we have Baptists, we have Lutherans. So was Judaism in the first century. The Pharisees were one of those denominations, and then the Sadducees, and there were several others that are not mentioned in the Bible. The Essenes, who lived in the wilderness, the Mathotians, the Hemerobaptists, as we know those others through Jewish literature. The Pharisees were perhaps the most religious people in Judaism. People would look, it was the largest denomination in Judaism, and people would look at the Jews, the common people, they would look at the Pharisees as example of religious people. And the simple people, the poor people, would say, I wish I could be like them, like the Pharisees. The Pharisees took their religious life very seriously. But they were so much concerned with details that sometimes they would lose track of the essence of religion. But Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And what else uh, John says about him? Verse 1, he was a ruler of the Jews, a leader of the Jews. That means he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the most important uh, Jewish body. It was a ruling body. It 
was a kind of Supreme Court court that would deal with uh, that would deal with religious and some civil matters as well. So we have here an important person, very important person. And Nicodemus refers to himself apparently as an old man. How can an old man go back, being old, go back to his mother's womb? An old man. Among the Jews, that classification means person was in his 60s. From his 60s onward, that was what the Jews would consider an old person, an old man. Among the Greeks and Romans, it was a little bit earlier. In his 50s, person, a gentleman, would be considered an old man. I personally don't like those categories. <laughs> don't ask me why. <laughs> I, I would set the, the date at least 10 years later <laughs> from this. But Nicodemus was an experienced person. He was not a new person. He had things to say. He had things to share based on his experience. And we know from another passage, Luke chapter 19, verse 39, that Nicodemus, who is mentioned two other times in the Gospel of John, we can infer that he was a very rich person. When Jesus was, when Jesus died and he came to bury Jesus, he brought 72 to 75 pounds of spices. That's a large amount. That was, uh, that was very, very expensive in those days. So we can infer that he was a rich person. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. That means he belonged to the aristocracy, to the noble families in in Israel. And as I said, he's mentioned two more times in the Gospel of John. Let's read those passages right away. John chapter 7, who has John 7, 50 and 52. So we can become more acquainted with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the one who came to him previously, being one of them, said to them, Our law doesn't judge a man before it hears from him. And knows what he's doing, does it? You aren't from the, you aren't from Galilee, also, are you? They replied to him. Investigate, and you will see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Thank you very much. What is the context of this passage? Jesus was preaching in the temple, and then Sanhedrin sent guards to arrest Jesus. And you know, we know the story. The guards came back without Jesus, and the Jewish authorities asked them. Where is he? And they were so amazed with the way Jesus spoke. No man ever spoke like that one. And they were afraid of arresting Jesus. And then that started a conversation among uh, the members of the Sanhedrin. And they were accusing Jesus. And all of a sudden, we read that Nicodemus stood up and said, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning? what he does is he it, it, it seems that Nicodemus is defending Jesus without being more explicit about any personal commitment to him he's, he's using the law and the Jewish practice in order to to protect Jesus let's go to John chapter 19 verses 38 42 it's another passage in which Nicodemus is mentioned After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who had first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bear it. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Thank you very much. Uh, 
So it is interesting, in this passage you read about Joseph of Arimathea, who was a kind of secret disciple. He followed Jesus, but secretly. Joseph of Arimathea. And all of a sudden, when Jesus died, he decided to, to move forward and, and to provide for Jesus' proper burial, together with Nicodemus. Was Nicodemus also a secret disciple? Let's read another passage, and that is John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. We don't have, Nicodemus is not mentioned in this passage, but this passage is relevant to what we are discussing here. John 12, 42 and 43. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Thank you very much. There were others, important people among the, the leaders. And could it this be a description of Joseph of Arimathea and maybe Nicodemus as well? John, at this point, he doesn't seem very much sympathetic about it, does he? He says with a, with a tone of criticism, they, they, they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. They loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God. Would it be that Nicodemus was hesitant after that meeting with Jesus? during the time, the years of Jesus' ministry. And eventually when Jesus died, he said, enough, I, I have to do something. This was really a picture from God. And I now believe and then he and Joseph of Arimathea provided for Jesus' burial. Nicodemus has a Greek name. Nicodemus is Greek. It's a compound name. It comes from Nike and Demos. They came in victory or conquest, and demos people. From demos, we have democracy, and from Nike, we have the tennis shoes. I, it's actually a Greek word, Nike, which means victory. I have used some Nike tennis shoes, and I did not win. So there was a problem with it. I, I, Trusted that that would help me to win my race, but it did not actually. So, this is Nicodemus, some information about him. Some people wonder if a certain Nakdemon, you see the vowels are pretty much the same Nicodemus, Nakdemon, Nakdemon, Nicodemus is a Greek name, Nakdemon is a, is a Hebrew name, it's an Aramaic name. There was a certain Nakdemon mentioned in Jewish Talmud, who lived in Jerusalem at the time of the destruction by the Romans in AD, around AD 70. He was an important person. He was a very rich person. He was a very influential person. His name was Nakedimon, Ben Gurion, son of Gurion. Some people say it could be, but I don't think that was the case. If he was already an old man in 27 AD, when he first met Jesus, 27, 28, uh, I don't think he would have lived until AD 70. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think this Nakdemon was another person. Uh, this was not a common name in Judaism, but it's not impossible to find other people the same name. All right, this is enough information about Nicodemus. Let's take a look at the context where the story of Nicodemus takes place. And so the story begins in chapter 3, but let's read the last three verses of chapter 2. And then we'll provide the context for the story of Nicodemus. Look at John chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, Many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. <clears throat> he did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. This is 
an interesting comment by John. Jesus was in Jerusalem. He had just cleansed the temple and performed many signs. Uh, many believed in his name, but Jesus did not commit himself to them. It's interesting. It goes against uh, what I would say uh, evangelistic interests. Now, here's an evangelist. He's preaching, and people are coming. People are coming. And the evangelist says, mm, I don't trust these people. I, I will not commit myself to them. And this is exactly what happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. People saw his signs, many signs, and they believed in his name, but Jesus knew that their belief was not real. And if we read the Gospel of John, we will see that contrast, people being concerned or believing in Jesus because of what Jesus could do for them. In John chapter 6, where he performs the, when he multiplies food, and people are following him, and they want him to, to perform more signs. And Jesus said, you are here only because you ate food, not because of me. And then he preaches a long sermon, John chapter 6, on the bread of life. Trying to lead people to understand that there is more than just miracles or signs. So this is what happened to it with most people who heard Jesus. Their faith was superficial. And it didn't come to the point of, of becoming an internal faith or changing their hearts, their perspective about life, about Jesus himself. So this is the context. And in this context, Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He came by night. Why did he come by night? Out of fear? Shame? Or to have more privacy? Some people say the rabbis used to discuss at night. Well, we have a few records of rabbis uh, meeting at night. Uh, based on the context, I would perhaps stick with the same, the first one. Jesus was a young person, very young person. Nicodemus was an old person. And he was one of the most important Jews of his days. So he used night as a cover. And he started, you are a teacher from God, because no one else can do the signs that you do. And I think he was right in his assessment. But Jesus went straight to the point and he said, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I just would like to call your attention. Uh, I, I know I'm speaking too much. Uh, I'd like to call your attention to the word that is used here. Uh, and it's the Greek word anoten. And anoten can have two meanings. Again, and from, from above. Which meaning fits better here? Scholars have a very clear answer. I'm going to say something more. Yeah, I wasn't going to answer that question, but I wanted to go back to the night thing. Sure. Um, I think it's just interesting if we fast forward here to verses 20 and 21, 22, where Jesus talks about people coming in, coming into the light and into the darkness. Almost the double meaning in verse 20, where Jesus says, you know, people don't come in the light. They come in the darkness. And he says, so their deeds will not be noticed. I think that's almost a tongue-in-cheek thing that I, that I believe Nicodemus had to pick up, even though it has a double meaning there. It was a double meaning for Nicodemus. It's a little chiding that Jesus did, which I think is just really interesting. That's an interesting, and I, I agree with your comments. And John is, this is another double meaning. This is a word with a double meaning. And both meanings are appropriate. To be born again means to be born from above. It's not as Nicodemus thought to go back to his mother's womb. It's a different kind of birth. To be born again is to be born from above, to be born from the Holy Spirit. Yes, we have a common day. One thing that just really kind of touches me when I read this story is um, just the, 
the sentence that jumps out in my mind is even good guys need to be born again. Um, because this would be this would have been assumed a good guy. Um, I know there's only one good guy, and that's Jesus, but in all practical purposes, this was a good guy. And something brought this good guy to the best guy. And that was that inner turmoil of, hey, I need something. And what strikes me too is later when he says, when he asks, answers Jesus, he says, how can this be? And I thought, where have I heard that before? How can this be? Well, didn't Mary say, how can this be when the angel told her she was going to have a, a child, a baby? So that is a miracle. Birth is a miracle. How can this be? And that's a, an appropriate question. It's just amazing, this amazing grace. But anyway, that's what comes to my mind is that um, I know we kind of chide him for coming at night, but I'm glad he came. So, as I said, Jesus further, uh, further down in verse 5, he would say, to be born again or from above means to be born of water and the spirit. And in verse 8, Jesus would say, to be born again and from above means to be born of the spirit. So he's talking about something spiritual taking place, miraculous taking place in the person's heart. And the Old Testament has several references of, of, on the renewal that is caused by the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, he certainly knew those references. He was a religious person. And we are not to suppose that because some or perhaps most of the Pharisees were hypocrites, that Nicodemus was one of those. There were certainly good people, as Mary mentioned, among the Pharisees. And it looks like Nicodemus was a sincere person. But he had problems. He had problems with what Jesus had just told him. He interpreted that anotan, not in terms of being born from above, but in terms of being born again, literally, going back to his mother's womb. And we just have to remember how the Jews, uh, what the Jews thought about themselves. We are offspring of Abraham. And they were very proud of their, of their uh, descendants of Abraham. We have our father. Our father is uh, Abraham. And that means for the Jews, almost kind of, we are saved. We don't have to worry about anything. We are children of Abraham. Abraham is our father. It's a kind of protection. We are already people of the covenant. We are saved. So can you imagine how difficult it might have been for Nicodemus to receive this statement from Jesus? You need to be born again. You need to be born from above. Nicodemus, as I told you, the Pharisees all refers to the Pharisees as the strictest, the, the strictest party among the Jews. And so why would Nicodemus need a new birth? With all those religious practices, with all his obedience to the law and all the purification baths that he would perform in his life, why would he need a new birth? So I, I don't think that Nicodemus, based on his understanding of the Old Testament, I don't think that he did not know what Jesus was talking about. His difficulty was how to apply what Jesus was saying to himself. I think there was a point. The Jews would baptize proselytes, Gentiles who converted to Judaism. They were called proselytes. And look at what the Jews would say. A convert who converts is like a newborn child. So this idea of being born again, the Jews knew it very well from the Old Testament and also from their own practice. But this refers to Gentiles, not to Jews. We are offspring of Abraham. So Nicodemus was having a hard time to apply these words to himself. Mary already mentioned something on this point, but I want to hear from you now. Sorry, it took so long to some insights on this 
first part of Jesus' dialogue with Nicodemus. I can understand a little bit of it just with this context of being children of Abraham. I think they were all looking to a Messiah to restore what their nation would be on earth, kind of like David and Solomon. They want to return to those days, get out from under the Roman rule. And I could relate to that if I was living in that time. They're not expecting a personal savior, someone to address them personally as needing a spiritual Messiah. That's not on their mind. Their, their country is being oppressed. They want to get their freedom back and have somebody lead them to victory. It's a complete mix-up, isn't it? It is. It is. And it looks like it is easier to turn a bad person into a good person than to turn a good person into a new creature. You get my point? Yes. But these also happen to us sometimes. Not a comfort. I was thinking about Nicodemus's education and not just him, but anybody in the Sanhedrin itself uh, that was considered a leader. And I also thought about your comment about the commoners look to the Pharisees as, oh, I wished I were like them because they know they have information. Not only do they have power and authority, but they have information. And I don't think it's anything new in our age I think it's existed for a long time that power comes from wealth and information, knowledge and information, and then wealth adds to that. And Nicodemus fit in that in that category for sure. It's really difficult, and I think for most of us that have any kind of education, to overcome that. Uh, I'll call it a barrier to believing in and trusting in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and to even recognize spiritual things. I don't know anybody's experience in here other than I'll just talk about mine in the sense of being so spiritually dead at one point in my life that I didn't recognize the simplest things about uh, scripture and, and I'll just use the illustration and this may be or it may not be the best one but it's one that at the time resonated and the pastors having a Bible study and he says yeah he said uh, thou shalt not commit adultery he's going through the Ten Commandments and he says thou shalt, thou shalt not commit adultery and I thought well I've never done that and he said and uh, Jesus clarified that by saying even those who lust after a woman. Well, then that changed the game. But that was an enlightening moment. You take and add a bunch of education on top of that. How much more difficult does it become for a person to receive the Spirit of God? And I mean, I think that we're living in a time when this story really ought to resonate with us about the challenges associated with the, the standard of living that we have, the amount of education that we have. And um, I don't know what it's like to not be able to read, but I've had someone walk into the church office one morning, Monday morning, and tell me about his committing adultery. And I wanted to share with him the scriptures on how quickly you can be forgiven and handed him and showed him in scripture but he could not read and this is in Portland, Tennessee, could not read so anyway I, I may be overemphasizing this fact but I'm not sure I am I think the, the level of education the level of information that we have the amount of information the continual indulgence in information I know this, I know that based on what I'm being taught, precludes us from opening our life and our heart to the Spirit. Thank you very much. And what about those who 
are born in the faith, those who grew up in the faith, those who have never left the church, never have never done anything really bad. So they also need a new birth. Yes. Oh, have another comment. Um, I think I think Nick, I think Nicodemus was genuinely, you know, curious to, to know more about Jesus. But I don't think he realized yet that this was the Messiah, this is God. It, and I think maybe they were all, how, how's he doing this? But I think he, as Mary said, was a good man, as you said, devout Jew, top of the top of the line. And I just think also when I think it's the human nature when we meet someone that we recognize, oh, this is a special person. And we have a lot in common. And when we meet them the first time, we want to we want to give them our best impression and, and then get some affirmation back. And I think that's the spirit he came to him, giving him all these compliments, and then probably hoping that what he would hear first is, yeah, Nicodemus, you are an exceptional Jew. And uh, thank you for your accolades. And now let's talk about, you know, whatever. And Jesus just went by all that and said, you need help with your heart, brother. So. Um, you know, I did it. It's an interesting exchange uh, when the light comes on. By the way, I have the next section, but I'm glad to yield the floor to Chris. I love that you're talking about this because when I, I had read this chapter in Desire of Ages before, but reading it this time, that's what jumped out at me. Um, and, you know, that, that Nicodemus. Um, really thought he was he was okay, you know, and, and I think that's part of the reason he was struggling with what Jesus was trying to share with him. But it talked about, Ellen White talked about how it wasn't Jesus, the look he gave Nicodemus or the tone that he spoke to Nicodemus in. It was Jesus' presence that brought out in Nicodemus's mind and heart what the truth was. And that was just a great reminder for me it's the time with Jesus when he makes these things clear and shows us the things in ourselves that need to change. That, um, you know, if we're talking to somebody else and, uh, you know, I relate to what Dane is saying, I think that's what I would have come to Jesus for too, so he could tell me how great I was doing. But um, the things that we're missing, his presence will point out to us um, how we can be more like he wants us to be. It was dark. But Nicodemus was in front of the light. And that is something that struck him. Well, of course, the Holy Spirit was working on his heart, even if he went in the dark. But it makes me think of how, how this brings out the fact that all of our righteousness, we may think we're doing pretty good because we haven't, you know, committed adultery. Okay, well, yeah, maybe I looked on a few women bless but our righteousness no matter how good it seems is filthy rags filthy rags because unless we have jesus righteousness covering us nothing we do that's good is any good and he recognized in himself even though he had been a leader of the people he was keeping all the you know or it seemed to be keeping all the rules i don't know his personal you know what was going on he thought he was doing okay, but he knew in his heart something wasn't right. And if people who, you're right, I totally agree that sometimes people get so much full of themselves after they've gotten really high in education and rich and all this other stuff. But look what Jesus said when he talked about his second coming and he said, people will come and say to me, but hey, I cast out devils in your name and I did this and this. And he says, I don't know you. To think that you could be doing those things and not know Jesus is a sobering thought, you know? Yes. So it's it's relationship. Let me move a little bit forward, and then I have a question for you. Uh, Jesus further illustrates <coughs> the new birth as being born of water and the spirit. Is Jesus referring here to baptism, being born of water and a spirit? 
We just have to remember that John's baptism is very clear in John's gospel more than in any other gospel. And John's baptism, as I shared with you a, a few weeks ago, when we were studying on John, John's baptism, John's baptism, John the Baptist, John's baptism was a moral baptism, something that it did not exist in Israel. In Israel, there were only ceremonial baptisms, ceremonial bathings. And John introduced the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So the baptism, John's baptism, which is now Christian baptism, is a moral baptism. The baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And John's gospel is the only one who talks about, well, we have Jesus' baptism, and John's gospel is the only one who talks about the disciples baptizing people. We don't read that in Matthew, we don't read that in Mark or in Luke, only in John's gospel. So the idea of being baptized is a very Johannine idea. We find that in John's gospel. So probably when Jesus was talking about water and the spirit, he was talking about water as a symbol of cleaning and purification, and then the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, what about flesh and spirit in verse 6? What do you think? How should we understand this statement by Jesus? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. What are your insights on this passage? All right, I will share with you what I think. Uh, if we read two other passages, we will not read it for the sake of time. Romans chapter 6, Titus chapter 3. Then uh, chances are that Jesus is referring to the two natures that a believer has. The natural nature. The nature that we have by just being a descendant of Adam. The nature that we have when we are born. And that nature is sinful. It's tainted by sin. And so we need to be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who creates the new self. He creates the new self. He gives us the chance to have a new life. So those who are born of the flesh, they cannot escape the limitations of the flesh, of the sinful nature. In order to escape the limitations of the sinful nature, we need something supernatural. We need to be born of the spirit. Yes, we have another uh, Just something to, to share. Um, I fellowship with a, a group of guys that are from different uh, Christian faith denominations, if you please, Baptist and, and Church of God and, and so forth. What I hear a lot of times is foreign to me in a conversation is talking about the flesh. They actually talk about it. They talk about the distinction between the flesh and the spirit. They recognize the difference when, when the flesh is causing them trouble in their life. And they will actually, they actually believe and pray for the power of the spirit. And what, what's come to light for me is that a distinction, there's a distinction of Adventists and other Christians in, in some respects anyway. We're a very educated and theologically oriented group of Christians. It's hard for us to, to say that, wow, I need the Spirit of God in my life or I need to pray for the Spirit to overcome something because we're educated we have a very laid out, clear theological understanding of the great controversy all the way down through the cross. And if we just have enough of that information, and if we can put all of that information together, 
and to where it makes sense, then we're there. I'm sorry, but that's where, to some degree, we're missing out on a lot. We need more than that. So this distinction between the flesh and the spirit is something worth pursuing or thinking about, <clears throat> not just in Nicodemus, but on down through scripture. And not that I'm, you know, well, just suffice it, that I think that pretty much covers what I was wanting to say. And then Jesus gives another illustration, the wind. And he says, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear it, it sounds, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. What Jesus is trying to say is that the new, the new birth is something mysterious. But at the same time, you can see the effect. We have another comment. It seems to be all I hear about now is artificial intelligence. I've, in my work career of many, many years, I've worked with people who, from the low end of educational experience that couldn't read, to the upper end of people with several different doctoral degrees. And I, so I can say that I've worked with people who I consider to have a lot of artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's, it's not a new concept to me. Um, and I think Nicodemus had a tremendous amount of artificial intelligence. He was a highly educated man, probably, you know, IQ wise in the, in the top echelon. But all of that knowledge, all of that learning did nothing for his salvation. It was just artificial intelligence because he didn't know where true intelligence comes from. So what exactly is the new birth? We are talking about new birth. We need a new birth. And what exactly is the new birth? We have a, a hand over there. Yes. Um, I think about the new birth. We, I think about where Paul says, they, uh, die daily to self. Um, I think about having a, a transformation of our characters, and that the Holy Spirit is working uh, in us on a day to day basis. And so, it just um, really makes us think about uh, the transformation of the, of the Christian character. You know, when I reach the Christ, it gives out many pointers of, of uh, having that uh, renewed experience, being more like Jesus. So that's kind of what I think of when I think about the new experience, being more saint on a day to day basis. Thank you, Carlos. I think the simplest illustration of the new word is conversion. Is experience of conversion. And what does conversion mean? Exactly what the word means. I was going this way and all of a sudden I died to myself and I chose a new direction. And I was going away from God and now I choose to go with God. And I was baptized when I was 11. And I came out of the water and I was absolutely the same. And the very following days I started having the, the, uh, the same temptations that I had before. It looked like either my baptism didn't work or baptism is not a something, a magic thing that will change our hearts. No, it is something that the Holy Spirit does in which we change our perspective about ourselves and about God. We are going one way, and then we decided to go in another way. We realize that we are sinners, that we need God, we need salvation. That God's plans for us is better than our plans. Even though we still will have problems, temptations, we still will fall. But we have reoriented our lives. We walk with God right now. So... Um the jail where I volunteer at 
there's a lot of drugs. A lot of people are there because of drugs. And fentanyl. Fentanyl is a killer. So I had two prisoners that literally were dead because of fentanyl. They were dead. The EMTs came and gave them a drug called Narcan. And a, these two guys needed three doses of Narcan. And it revived them. And I said to the group of men, Jesus is our Narcan. We are dead. But Narcan revived, and they understood that. They have seen that. And that's what the gospel is. Literally, we're dead. And they knew these two men. That, In fact, one of the men, his name's Billy, they called him the dead man walking. That's how... That's how desperate the world is. So if you ever contact people um, involved in drugs, tell them Jesus is the Narcan, and they will understand that. All right. We have another hand over here, here in the front. And then we are going to move to uh, John chapter 3, verses 9 to 13, right here in the front. Just sitting here thinking about my life. Why did I do all that I've done all, these, all over the world for all these people? For them to have a new birth. So I had to ask, what was that? What's that new birth? Why did I do what I did? Uh, for them to have a lifestyle change. So they can be better than what they were before I came for help. So that new life not only is to be a, a repentant life, but a, a new commitment life, and a loving life, and a responsibility of life uh, to love themselves and to love their neighbors. So if we can't uh, produce that in our relationship with others, then we haven't received that commitment every day that we need even today. Uh, in our relationship with one another, that uh, that spirit needs to be changed on a daily basis. Yes. Okay, who has this passage? John chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. Then we're going to move quickly over this passage because I still want to spend some time on the passage here. Okay, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. That is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicodemus asked ask us a second, a third question to Jesus, or he asked Jesus question for the third time. Nicodemus only asks three questions in this whole dialogue. Uh, he first says that Jesus is a rabbi, come from God, and then how can a man be born when he's old? And then this question over here, how can these things be? Jesus replied, saying that he is a teacher and he should understand. It is interesting to see that John, that interesting change in the, uh, the way John words the story. He moves from the singular, I say to you, to the plural you do not receive. Jesus had a larger audi audience in mind when he moved from the singular to the plural. And the John John's gospel is the story of Jewish refusal to receive Jesus. So there is more here who is 
embodied by Nicodemus. And these earthly things versus heavenly things, uh, it is Jesus is was somewhat saying Nicodemus, the new birth is something that you understand. So this would be the earthly thing, the earthly thing. But I have much more to reveal you, to tell you this would be the heavenly thing. You, you are uh, stuck with the earthly things. And how can I reveal to you much more? I wish uh, I would do this. And, and then in verse 13, we read about Jesus. Uh, no one has descended into heaven except the one has ascended to heaven, except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. The Jews in Jesus' time believed that Moses, Abraham, and other great characters of the Old Testament had ascended to heaven. And they had wonderful visions and encounters with God. And so they came down and were able to share their story with people. This is what the Jews believed. And Jesus said, no one has ascended to heaven. Nicodemus. It is the Son of Man who has come down from heaven. He's the only one who reveals about the Father. He was bringing Nicodemus back to the heart of the story. And then we have this other passage. Who has verses 14 and 15? Just as Moses lifted up the snakes in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Thank you very much. We know the story. The story of the bronze serpent that appears in Numbers chapter 21. People of Israel, uh, because of their uh, complaints, they were beaten by poisonous snakes. And then Moses, uh, God told Moses to make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and pole, and whoever looked to that serpent uh, would live. Now, this is an object lesson of what Jesus means to us. Look at what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. By becoming a curse. So it's the poisonous serpent because we are beaten by this poisonous serpent because we are sinful. Then someone needs to carry our sins and we need to look at him. We need to see ourselves in him. That is our penalty. That is what we deserve. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, says Peter. So, and then Jesus talked about being lifted up. No question that he's talking about the cross. And it is interesting that the word that John uses for uh, being lifted up also means to exalt. And that emphasis also appear in John's gospel. Jesus' death on the cross, when he was lifted up, that was the moment when he was exalted. We tend to see the cross as a symbol of shame, and it was in the Roman Empire a symbol of shame, of defeat. But in John's gospel, it is a moment of glory. And whoever looks at that person on the cross, Whoever sees himself in that person on the cross, that person will bear. When I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. How does Jesus, how does this take place? How does this take place? How does Jesus is able to, to draw all people, all people to himself? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, Thousands of people were crucified in the ancient world. Only Jews, we have a record that one day, Quintinius Valus, uh, uh, Valus the, the governor of Syria, crucified 2,000 Jews in one day. And Josephus talks about 500 people being crucified every day in the context of the destruction of Jerusalem. Every day, 500 people. Why? That cross on Calvary is the one that draws us. Why are we drawn to that cross and not to the other? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. And then John introduces the theme of eternal life. 
that's very common in John's gospel, John talks about eternal life. Let me just say quickly something about eternal life. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in Jewish theology of the time, eternal life was something future. It is the life in the age to come, but not in John's gospel. In John's gospel, eternal life begins now. It begins now. It's a present reality. He told this to the Samaritan woman. The water that I will give will become in him a spring of water, coming up to eternal life. <clears throat> to the Jews in John chapter 6, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And in John chapter 10, I came that they may have life, and life, and may, and have it abundantly. That is the purpose of Jesus. And when does that life begin? Now, Jesus is life. It's by accepting Jesus. You remember when Lazarus died? When Lazarus died? Martha, oh, if you were here, you would not have died. Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So when does eternal life begin? Now, even if we die, that's just a brief interruption. We already have assurance of life. Assurance of life to Jesus Christ. So let's move to our final passage. If you can bear with me a few more minutes. Uh, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that they so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Thank you very much. I wish I would have more time. Whose words are these? Jesus or John? Those who have red letter Bibles see that all the way to verse 21 is in red. So according to the editors, it is Jesus' words. Well, most commentators don't think it is Jesus. They think it is John's word. Jesus' words we have finished in verse 15, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And now on from verse 16 onwards would be John's words. It's a kind of, let me just put it simply, a little sermon preached by John based on Jesus' words to Nicodemus. It's a little sermon preached by John. How can we know that? Well, uh, if you look at these words, we have an assessment of the entire ministry of Jesus. John is speaking from the perspective of the end of Jesus' ministry. He came for this purpose. This is what he did. If you believe in him, then you will not be condemned if you do not believe. So it looks like it is an assessment, but we don't have to spend time on this. So just remember that those red letter Bibles, this is an editorial thing. The editors put in them. And just remember that Jesus spoke in Aramaic, not in Greek. Yeah. And what we have are the evangelists' way to convey the words of Jesus. Uh, yeah, let's skip this part over here. And then, why did Jesus come to the world? To save, not to condemn. How to receive that salvation? To faith. Whoever believes in him. Why will some people be condemned? We tend to try to think that condemnation is a result of our wrongdoing. 
This is not what John said. This is not what John says. No one will be condemned by his or her wrongdoings. Because those who will be saved, they have also committed sins and wrongdoings. Despite of that, they are saved. So then the difference has to be looked at something else, someone else. Are you with me? And what is it that John says? This is the condemnation, that the light came, but people did what? They loved more darkness than light. They did not believe in the light. They did not accept the light. So all of us are sinners. What makes the difference is our reaction to Jesus. How we react to Jesus, whether we believe in him or not. That is what makes the whole difference. Any comment to this point? So let me go to the conclusion. Look at what John says. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. That is the reason why people be condemned, because they have rejected the light. What is it that comes first, unbelief or disobedience? Unbelief or disobedience? What is it that comes first, according to John? Third line. They love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. According to John, what is it that comes first? Disobedience comes first. Have you ever heard those people? No, I like what I do, and I don't want to hear about this thing, Jesus Christ, salvation. Disobedience comes first. Disobedience. People hate light and love darkness because the evil deeds of the human heart. They reject the light because they do not want to have their evil deeds exposed. The process of having the evil deeds exposed may be painful, yet they are inexcusable. Because exposing the bad, the bad deeds is part of the healing process. On the other hand, those who live by the truth simply come to the light. They do not fear being reproved because their deeds are done in God. And this is what the light will reveal. Uh, those who live by the truth, those who are sincere, those who are honest, those who actually were touched by the Holy Spirit and who opened their hearts to the truth, to the light. May this be our experience. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for allowing us uh, to kind of peek in on this private conversation and make it public. You had with Nicodemus. I pray, Lord, that as each one of us leaves this room, um, that we will make a firm commitment to uh, to be born again each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and attention. Sorry if I spoke too much today.